Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So thank you all for coming and welcome to the 2015 Upper Midwest Aviation Symposium. My name is Kyle Warner. I'm the director of the North Dakota Aeronautics Commission and uh, thank you for attending our this year's Aerial Applicator Safety Meeting. By attending this meeting today or watching this video online, uh, you are engaging in, in this participation of, of this um, um, safety meeting and are fulfilling the annual requirement uh, to serve as an aerial applicator in the state. So we have some great speakers for you today and I hope that you can give them your full attention and um, let's look forward to a safe and fulfilling year in 2015 as we uh, continue to aerial applicate our, our crops in North Dakota. So I'm going to turn over here to Andy and, and Rich Altendorf as they talk about maintenance practices in North Dakota. My name is Andy Tybert, and I, I, uh, I'm an ag operator up in uh, Grafton, North Dakota, and uh, I'm along here with uh, Rich Altendorf, and we're just going to talk about a few items that we've maybe seen around the shop or uh, in the last uh, short while on some maintenance issues, and uh, maybe maybe some of you can take those back and uh, you know avoid some problems in your shop. Um, earlier this week, I was at the uh, uh, applicators conference and during the past program it seemed to me that they that they were presenting some very very elementary issues I mean they were like wow who wouldn't know this and then I got thinking back that uh, uh, some of our pilots that we've hired uh, one of those uh, pilots had uh, supposedly 6,000 hours and the other one was 2,000 hours approximately the lower time one had an A&P and an IA and they were calling back with uh, to other other pilots asking some some advice on setting suck back and I kinda thought to myself who wouldn't know that how could they not know about suck back that should be something that you would learn about in before you ever even got in but uh, apparently several things pass by people and in my opinion, I think those people missed some, some key foundation in learning and as they got a job, I do believe they were either too proud or in fear of maybe uh, th you know, the boss man thinking, how did you not know that, that they were too afraid to ask. So, but that scenario is not a good one. I think if you have questions on anything, you should be able to freely ask you know, and, uh, and, and try to learn from something. But uh, so anyway, we just, uh, um, Rich and I kind of got together and uh, uh, we, morning. pardon? This morning. Yeah. <laughs> Rich has more knowledge in the shop than probably anybody I know. I've known him for a long time and he's taken care of a lot of these mostly ag specific airplanes uh, in his career. And uh, I think he has probably forgot more than some mechanics will ever know. <laughs> He's, uh, he runs a, re a very reputable shop. And, uh, and so uh, we'll just start covering a few of the items that we've encountered um, in, in our respective shops uh, over the last while. And uh, do you want to go first, Rich? Oh, sure. Let's, uh, you might as well start with, as long as the FAA is here, Paperwork and uh, recurring AD notes and things like that, I guess. Most airplanes have recurring AD notes. Everybody, when they do their annuals, comes and reads their logbook, don't they? And make sure that everything's signed off right and, and, and looks for your recurring ADs when they're due next. I'm sure you do. Glenn knows that. Well, here's, a, here's an example of a 100-hour inspection. Granted, this is an old airplane. This is an airplane back in the 40s but the AD still applies. Uh, you got a wheel half, 100 hour inspection, but it's, it's nasty. You got to pull the wheels off or the, the tires off to find it. Okay, every 100 hours. After 70 years of pounding around, you'll find it. Uh, Air Tractor has an AD on the upper Longeron attached on the horizontal stabilizer. Every 150 hours, I think. Uh, 
Guys out in west of Minot last year just about lost their tail, 70 hours out of an inspection. Uh, egg cats have recurring ADs with times. Uh, Cessna is a good one, a seat rail inspection every 100 hours. Well, you guys never really, until recently, started paying attention to these recurring ADs, but it's, it's kind of, they're checking on them. Yeah, you know, I don't know if you're getting bored in the office, you're trying to find them now, but they're more aware of them, and it's something that should be addressed. And, and uh, a lot of ANPs, when they do their log books, they'll have just your, your normal sign-offs and your AD sheet, but then they'll have a, a separate recurring AD sheet, you know. And uh, just to keep track of them separately, you should know where they're at in case somebody asks, I guess, is the point that I'm getting at. Uh, that's about it for inspections. ADs, ADs though, there is a... I know how many guys are running turbines, but there's an upcoming AD for uh, containment ring reinforcement on the PT6. Mostly the older ones, not the new ones. I know like your Dash 20 Glenn will probably have that due, what is it, three years, I think. And this is a, this is a containment ring. This is a good one, there's nothing bad here, but uh, the AD just basically applies to welding in a 16th inch liner on the outside of this. But turbines, I guess, uh, they must be more afraid of them. They, when they write AD notes, they don't say things like uh, engine failure or anything. They, they read like uh, uncontained turbine wheel disintegration. And, you know, it, it sounds pretty serious, you know, <laughs> I guess. They're supposed to fix that, I guess. Uh, were they, uh, you were mentioning earlier, they were talking about excluding single engine operations possibly for that, or one of, that was one of the comments. Like yeah, on the, on the write-up sheet for the AD, they had some discussion as far as why it should not include aerial applicators. And one comment was made, well, that when all the pieces come out of the engine, they're not going to perforate the cockpit and, and hurt any passengers in a twin engine airplane. So they thought they didn't need it. We didn't need to. <laughs> I, I didn't think that was a real good reason not to have it. <laughs> but uh, that's one thing on AD notes, I guess. Uh, I got some things here. Boy, uh, we were going to talk about wheels and brakes is where this all was going to start. And I brought a wheel. You guys are, are doing your you guys are doing your own wheels and brakes and packing things. A couple little things to look for, as simple as uh, bending a cotter key over. You know, you don't bend it over far enough, and uh, you're going to cut your cap up. You won't you won't notice it till the mechanic charges you 50 bucks to change it at the annual, or unless it falls off and you get dirt in your wheel bearings. Uh, more on wheels, tail wheels, bent pins. Locks on when you're moving the airplanes around. How often does that happen? You've got parts that are interchangeable or replaceable. But uh, there again, you're wobbling down the runway or it doesn't steer straight. Your loader boy is going across the ramp and, and there's smoke coming off the back tire and it's not turning when it wants. And, and you wonder why things get bent. These are only $170 a piece, I think. Yeah, $140. You know. Uh, all this kind of adds up. If you, then what? Your turn. Hey, here. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I don't know how this is going to go. I don't know how many of you guys watch. Uh, what are them tap? No, what's up, guys, on Saturday morning? Clickety clack. That's Clickety clack, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's aviation click and clack. Um, Sometimes, uh, you know, prices is a uh, desirable thing. And so occasionally you see a, a deal that is out there and, you know, the old story, if a price is too good to be true, it probably is. Here is uh, an example uh, of, an, of a Garrett engine, uh, pretty, pretty decent price on it and everything like that. And it ended up on an airplane and uh, it ran about 10 hours, and th th all of a sudden it was kind of making some noise, even in the air. And uh, the airplane made it to the runway. He ma just barely made the runway and rolled out, and the engine is still running, but the propeller has stopped. And this is on a direct drive Garrett engine, so that's not a good scenario to have. Uh, after some investigation, this, this was found out that there was a prop strike on this engine. And there is a tooth missing. Uh, by the way, this is the main, or one of the main drive gears on the, uh, on the engine. And uh, 
There's a tooth missing on here, and I think what happened is uh, this engine had a previous prop strike, and uh, the, the jagged edge on this gear is ultimately all that was driving the engine until it finally rounded off and could essentially spin out. So just be, uh, just be cautious and careful of your sources of items too, that, that they're from a reputable shop. Uh, there's in, in this turbine world right now, no one likes to pay these astronomical crazy prices of this stuff, but uh, sometimes there is no way that you, can, you, you can't afford to, to buy the cheaper deal. It, it'll, it'll bite you in the end. Uh, luckily, no one was hurt on this thing, number one, and second of all, the airframe was, you know, he made it to the runway. It was completely salvaged, so uh, it could have, been a, could have been a disastrous deal. Um, if you're coming up at the wrong time in a field and this thing would have spun out, could have cost, cost this person his life. So, um, here is a, uh, a second item that uh, out of a, yeah, I want to, in my opinion, it's a substandard shop. But uh, this has probably has to do with more complacency or, or dis diversion of attention, distraction, whatever you want to call it. Because uh, uh, what this is, is the um, fuel nozzle shroud. And the fuel nozzles, if you, can, if you can see here, there's a flange and the fuel nozzle goes in and the hole is at an angle. So the, you know, the, the nozzle comes out at an angle. Uh, but there's a hole burnt here. You can easily reverse the direction of the nozzle. And uh, this ultimately ended up not only burning a hole in the shroud, but it caused streaking and a, uh, and a turbine wheel to be, uh, you know, on a borescope. Uh, the engine was losing power and they found out that the wheel was all cut out. Uh, so, you know, that, uh, that's probably more about human factors in the shop more than anything, probably even more than, I don't know why sometimes human factors tend to fail in a substandard shop though, but. <laughs> so I'll just pass that around, you they can look at it. <laughs> yeah. I'll cover um, <clears throat> just on some fuel system stuff. Uh, Fuel contamination, you know, is, is a huge problem, especially in some of these sprayers and some of the tanks that things are stored in. Fuel contamination can end up to be a real problem. And uh, these couple of drain valves are out of, a, out of an old Cessna 172. It was in about a 1964, I do believe. But the guy said uh, on his tank drains, he couldn't operate the drain anymore. It was on this one. So he said, order me in one. And I said, well, they're all painted over. They're kind of old looking and kind of rusty. I'm, I'm suspecting that both are bad. And I'll just pass these around. If they've been in there that long that you can't remember the last time they were changed, between the O-rings and the seals uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the drain itself, it's just time to uh, move them on. Uh, we follow in the same things in all the tank drains and the header tank drains and all these sprayers too. Uh, I, I mostly grabbed these because they were right on my toolbox and, uh, and, uh, but they're, they're a classic example of how water can, you know, start rusting some of this stuff up. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, at least, uh, at least once every other year. <laughs> But I, do, I try to keep the, the drains if free and operating. And, uh, you know, I, I happened to run into uh, Gil Hughes, who is the, uh, uh, he's the owner of Curtis Drain Valve. And that's kind of a generic name, but uh, uh, they're very familiar out in the field. And we got talking about his drains. And in many years back, they used to be able to sell uh, they sold new seals for these drains. And uh, he stopped. He stopped selling just the seals and he says, I'd rather lower the price of the valve and have you replace the entire valve simply because, uh, he says, the seals get cold formed, they get old, they crack, and in, with that, along uh, with that, springs are rusting out, and uh, it is basically just time to spin in a new valve. And uh, these are down at, I think they're near twenty some dollars or 
$20, give or take a little bit. So that's what he's just trying to uh, get you to replace the entire unit versus taking them out and, and trying to do a marginal repair on them. So I'll, I'll kind of pass these around. Uh, many of you have seen those. Andy, didn't, didn't a lot of that start when, when guys, the Curtis quit making, they used to have a flat O-ring, that's where the seal is? And then the people were putting in regular round O-rings in them? And, yeah. And they were having, they had uh, same, they had legal issues because of that. Yeah, the, the O-ring would pop off and ultimately they'd end up with an uncontained leak, usually if they're flying and could even lead to fuel starvation if they completely ran it dry. <laughs> Is it your turn again, oh, Clack? Sure, why not? You said something about uh, <laughs> human failure and human, human error. I guess uh, we're all pilots in here, and, and looks to me by the people in the room here, it's all, I don't see a lot of new guys, a lot of faces I've seen for a long time. And, uh, you know, we kind of get complacent flying around these airplanes, and and... We're kind of set in our ways, and we go look at the airplane, we jump it in, and we go to work, and I don't know how many guys are playing with your Bluetooth while you're in there or making cell phone calls, or maybe, what do you got, well, GoPros, you're probably adjusting your GoPros now so you can send out a film, is that? <laughs> but here, here, here's an example of an experienced pilot. Yeah, selfies, yeah, there you go, yeah. You know, that's, that's a common thing. Experienced pilot, one pine tree obstacle in the field, and he blinked for a second, and, and that actually was the only blade damaged on the propeller. And uh, the airframe, he, he landed it on the road, and uh, minimal damage to the airplane, a couple of fairings where some bushes went by, nothing bent, no leading edges, and nothing. But by the time the engine got out of the shop, it was really close to $200,000. You know, the, the burner can was bent. Uh, tip was bad, and then they found out that his blades were no good on a CT wheel, they'd been ground, so he had to buy new blades, you know. But that's an experienced guy, and just a split second, he'd become complacent, and that's all it takes, you know. Um, I have, I have kind of have an issue with some of this new technology that's getting put in airplanes. It's, it's Velcroed on everywhere, and it's put on with tie wraps everywhere, and you got gobs of wires, and hookups, and you know, it's uh, kind of back to the old you know, proverb, you keep it simple, stupid, and then you don't have to monkey with all of that, and you can pay attention to what you're supposed to be doing. And I guess that's just the way you're taught, I guess, to begin with. And maybe I just, my kids say I'm technologically handicapped, so I guess that's, that goes along with that. But you go back to that turbine and keep on going back through it, uh, you're stopping a gearbox that's got, golly, I don't even remember what, they, what, did, what did Hollis say at the meeting? whole bunch of reduction. It's turning 2,200 pounds, or 2,200 RPM and got 1,600 foot-pounds of torque on the propeller. And it goes backwards through the gearbox to the power turbine, and the power turbine is spinning 33,000 RPM. And uh, this, is, this is what drives that whole engine right here. You got a 600 horse, well, you have, it runs the same size, whether it's a Dash 20 up to uh, the big series, the 42 series, has basically the same gear. And that's all it is, that one little tooth there, 33,000 RPM. And they've never had failures with them. They can break propellers and break gearboxes, and, and they really don't really have too much trouble back in that end. But it doesn't seem like much, not compared to most of you guys with all the iron and pistons going up and down on a 1340 and clanking and rattling, and it just doesn't, doesn't seem like much, you know. Somewhere in that engine also is uh, uh, air filters. And this, is, this is the first stage compressor on a PT-6. It really doesn't have any damage on it. I just brought it along because if you've got a bad air filter or, or no air filter, Garrett's don't have one, so it, it's, it's not this piece, but exactly the same piece is sitting right there. It's right in the open. You can see it in the air inlet. And you look at it, it's, it's really a pretty flimsy deal. And you start getting nicks in it and such, you wonder at that RPM they're turning, uh, how, how, how it's all gonna stay together. This is your number one bearing. Those PT6s, they start at one end and go to the other, but I know this is the first one. <laughs> it's on the back. That runs your gearbox, your, uh, 
I think there's a loose piece on the race might fall off if you don't hold it right side up. But uh, you got three more stages like that, and then you got a centrifugal compressor. And uh, you know, if you get any foreign object damage and one of those comes loose, well, you just got a lot of pieces flying around trying to trying to get out. And uh, you. <laughs> Yeah, it gets worse progressively. As a, a guy doesn't think about it, but I remember I was working for Mark Holy over in East Grand Forks, and he bought a lane conversion, and uh, he, had a, he had a compressor blade failure. So basically, he just saw nothing but sparks come out the exhaust, and the engine quit. And he was ferrying back to the field, and he lined up on this field, and he just about had it made, and for some reason, he decided he'd reach over and feather the propeller. And, it, and he did. And... Uh, he just about overshot the shot his landing site because he lost all the drag that he was that he had, you know. But he never thought about it. Normal come in for landing, he didn't think he could feather the propeller. And then you look at that burner can, and there'd been a whole bunch of people in there with ice picks trying to get out of it, and, and that was that was expensive. But you look at some of these like uh, oh the well egg caps, you know, you got a Beechcraft King Air air filter on it. Who knows how old it is? Wire mesh, a lot of pieces in there could break loose. I mean, you have to you have to look at not just the uh, you have to look at the air filter, the intake system, make sure it's tight. Hall has talked about that a lot about things loose in the engine compartment that can get in, and and that's the first thing that it's going to get to. And then there is uh, well, there's paper filters. Uh, I think the paper filters are a mandatory replacement on an annual basis, right? Or five hundred dollars. Yeah, 500 hours at AD on all paper filters, I think. Just a lot of little things to look out for. Uh, I only got one more little little doodad here, I guess. I got a kick out of this. This isn't off a sprayer, but, well, maybe some of you guys sprayed in champs. I don't know. How, who's the oldest? <laughs> Wait a minute, I won't say nothing. Uh, hard landing. Okay, you start looking at things. You bounced it in, you know, you, well, okay, heavy load, you had to come back full and it wasn't so smooth. Uh, all of a sudden you look, the airplane's sitting kind of crooked. Boy, it doesn't, it doesn't look the same, you know. You know, you got a thrush, maybe, maybe, your, maybe your biscuits are blown out of, the, out of the shock strut as hard as that seems would be possible. <coughs> Thrush has got problems with cracks around the gear attach points. You know, you start putting 500 gallons in an airplane made to haul three. <laughs> you, have you ever bounced the airplane, Andy? Once. Okay. <laughs> you know, uh, this is this is the uh, this is the end of a, a gear strut off a seven AC champ. And if you look at it really close, the hole is stretched out and it's starting to come apart. I mean, he survived the landing. He didn't really wreck the airplane too bad. But I mean, uh, that that's really close to uh, having that whole end come off and then the whole gear folds up. The interesting part about that hole that's there. What is that, got about a half inch hole, five, you know, five eighths hole? I imagine over the years all the flight instruction or the training and stuff that that airplane's got on it, maybe, uh, maybe the holes got wore out once and the mechanic figured he'd go f oversized hole. <laughs> so he drilled a, ran a drill or a reamer through there and put the next size bolt in. That's supposed to be a 5 16 bolt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. So you get, you know, but you figure it's just a champ. You're just floating around in the evening. You're never that. What do they call it? Uh, no bounce gear? Is that what they have on them? Yeah. yeah. You know, but that's the thing you kind of find. You got to look out for. Uh, yeah, Jeepers. Your uh, your bearings? No, your uh, cottage cheese container is lasting longer than my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> One of the last items I have here is uh, just some different bearings that we found uh, uh, on, a, on the last uh, annual inspection on a 502. Uh, these first two smaller ones are from the flap uh, uh, bar. Uh, the actuator hooks up on one end and the flap bar rotates and actuates the flaps. And these are the little bearings that uh, that rotated on. And they found, you know, on and or on, uh, excuse me, on pre-flight, uh, if the flaps were down, you, you tended to get a lot of play in them. 
and uh, if you pulled up on the trailing edge of the flap, you got some where it would kind of clunk. And we got looking into that. That was enough of that. Uh, they were, you know, they moved a little bit, and you could hear a clunk. So something is giving. And uh, we looked around and found uh, found these bearings that uh, needed some replacing. On a 502, also uh, they have a. Um, whenever you deploy the flaps, the ailerons also droop along with the flaps for extra lift. And there's a bell crank assembly in there that um, uh, also operates, you know, the, the ailerons as you're, as you're uh, putting the flaps down. And there, that bell crank is on a couple of bearings here. And uh, we noticed that the, the motor seemed to be laboring a lot. Even on the down position, it was laboring and, and, and uh, wasn't moving freely. So we got looking into that and uh, found these bearings uh, on, the, on the bell crank that were all rusted up. And in fact, they were turning on the bolt. So I'll just pass those around. These are just items that you're, you know uh, your mechanic should be looking at. Um, we've made that standard practice uh, to take out that bolt every year, take that apart, make sure there's good grease in there and everything is turning good, and, and uh, put it back together. I guess on, uh, I don't have any more items and... The only thing I was going to say is that, uh, I guess, you get in an airplane to go and start it, there's things you kind of take for granted, you know, you, you always yell clear before you, uh, you hit the starter, but uh, I was surprised last winter when we crawled into, a, it was uh, a PT-6 powered airplane, but I think Garrett has the same electrical system, they got the carbon pile regulator and the RCR. Uh, I was up front, and he was, uh, he was just going to spin the engine over, uh, motor at foil pressure, and he hit, the, he hit the master switch, and the engine came to life. I mean, it started spinning over when he just turned the master switch on. The RCR had shorted out, and it was, it was back feeding through the generator side, but the engine, the engine turned over. It didn't run up to speed, and we got it shut off, but if, you know, uh, Garrett, you got a direct drive and get clunked to the head. The PT-6, it'll maybe slap you, but it won't hurt you too bad. Yeah. But still, it came to life, and and uh, being the reverse current, rever reverse current rally, correct? Yep. And uh, what the heck was the other thing I was going to say? Huh. Well, I guess that's basically it. You got just got to be careful out there. Huh. Made it half an hour. <laughs> Do we have any questions from anybody? Yeah. Comments, questions. Well, thank you. Thank you, Rich and Andy. Uh, next up, we have Jeremiah Lean from the Department of Agriculture here for uh, an update. Should work there, right? Yep. That's great. Well, I'm Jeremiah with the Department of Ag. Um, my title is a pesticide outreach specialist, or POS is the easier way to remember it. <laughs> um, what I do for the department is I'm a uh, non-regulatory source for anybody that uses pesticides to go to. So I'm not an inspector. I look for what inspectors look for. I communicate it with you, and that's as far as it goes. So I'll have my contact information up on the end. If anybody has uh, any questions, they can always give me a call or shoot me an email. Um, drift continues to be an issue. I imagine when you sit through a training, uh, you're going to hear about it. Basically, if somebody uh, files a complaint and uh, the residue of what you were spraying is found off target, more than likely it's not going to go too well. Um, increased public concerns. Uh, the point that I address there is people are moving to the state from all over. Um, wherever they have moved from, they may have done things differently or most likely have done things differently. And so we, we receive a lot of calls in the office asking, can they be out there spraying? Um, you know, and I'll respond or whoever answers responds with, is it really windy out? If they say no, or well, are they spraying on your property? No. Then we say, yes, they can be out there. They have just as much right as everybody else does to be out there. But just be aware that more and more people are coming here, they are watching and they do call. 
Uh, sometimes they overstep us and they just call EPA directly. Um, so, uh, dealing with contaminating water, this is an example of a bullet label and it says alicornis metabolites are known to leach through the soil into groundwater under certain conditions. Um, use of this product in areas where soils are permeable, particularly, particularly where the water table is shallow, may result in groundwater contamination. Do not apply to highly permeable soils as classified by the NRCS, where the depth to groundwater is 30 feet or less. And they are doing water testing, and they have found atrazine, and so far the levels are below the benchmark. However, if they keep noticing these levels or the levels go past the benchmark, you can expect there's probably going to be more regulations or EPA may pull uh, the chemical entirely. So we want to make sure that we're watching around water um, so we continue to have those tools and they don't get pulled. And nobody wants more regulations that I'm aware of anyways. Uh, this part of the label just says that it has a high potential for runoff uh, into surface water several weeks after the application. Buffer zones. This product must not be applied airily or by ground within 66 feet of the points where the field surface water runoff enters perennial or intermittent streams and rivers or within 200 feet around natural or impounded lakes and reservoirs. If the land is uh, highly erodible, the 66-foot buffer must be planted to a suitable crop or a grass filter strip or something like that. And this is just for that bullet label. I'm just using it as, as examples of what you may see on the labels that you're applying. And uh, most likely, the labels that you're applying are going to have this statement on here. This product is toxic to terrestrial and aquatic plants, fish, aquatic invertebrates. Do not apply directly to water to areas where surface water is present. Um, in 2009, EPA was sued by an environmental group, and they lost. And now if you apply chemicals to water, it's a violation of the Clean Water Act. And if you sat through a training, you've probably heard some of this already. I, I'm not, I don't know if you've sat through a research uh, lately or not. But um, so. If, it's a violation of the Clean Water Act. The Department of Health regulates the Clean Water Act. Um, but the biggest thing is it allows for citizen-to-citizen -citizen lawsuits. And so if somebody sees you spray over, say it's an inch of sheet water in the field, a couple inches or whatever, and they see that, it allows them to litigate against you. So that's what I just want to make everybody aware of. If it is labeled to spray across water, that's the first step. And then the second step is to contact the Department of Health. And it would be a one-page notice of intent uh, form that you'd fill out. The spill kit definition changed a little bit. Basically says enough absorbent material to absorb five gallons of liquid. One or more impervious containers with a combined capacity of 10 gallons and tools to collect it. So if you have a couple five-gallon pails, a bag of floor dry, and a shovel, you'd have a spill kit. You can get as inventive as you want. You can buy the absorbing pillows and all that stuff, just as long as they meet the quantity. For records, make sure to keep complete records. Uh, retain them for three years. The part that changed was they must be filled out within 24 hours of the application. A uh, customer needs to receive a copy of the app records unless the customer says in writing that they're allowing you to maintain their record for them. Um, and then the inspection takes less time if records are in one place. That's just if the inspector shows up and half of the records were wrote on receipts and the other half on uh, you know some paper towel or something like that, the inspector will be there just that much longer. Um, but you, it's nothing is required that you have to have them in one place. It's just stating the fact that you know, the inspection will take less time. Uh, last year I had a couple questions from doing trainings uh, asking if there was a smartphone app for, uh, for record keeping for pesticides. At that time I didn't know, but I looked into it. There's one called Pesticide Pal. They customize it to whatever state you're spraying in's requirements, that state's requirements. And then basically you would submit your form and you'd get an email 
uh, of your app record. And then of course, if you had to submit it to a client, if you had their email, you can forward it on. And then you wouldn't have to worry about duplicate copies or that type of stuff. But um, if you are gonna use an app, just make sure that it has all the state's requirements in it. And this one apparently does. Human endangerment, this last year there was a significant increase, both with aerial and ground, uh, agricultural and ornamental and turf applications. So that's one that the department takes serious. Um, again, if they get a complaint, what they'll do is, uh, especially with human endangerment, they'll ask if they can uh, take a piece of the clothing that the person was wearing. They'll send it in to be tested. And again, of course, if it comes back hot with what you were spraying, um, it's probably not gonna go too well. So uh, the biggest thing is just be cognizant of your surroundings. Um, you know, if there's a farmstead there, uh, if the wind's especially blowing towards the farmstead that day, just watch those types of things. Uh, people running down the road, you know, there's all, just depends on where you're at, but. Safe send. Is everybody familiar with safe send in here? Or probably mostly, yeah. It's a, it's a good program, it's free, it doesn't cost you anything. So the thing I ask is if it's over a thousand pounds, call me probably five days in advance and let me know what you have. Um, I get a lot of calls a couple hours beforehand and they'll say, you know, I, I got you know, 3,000 pounds, I'm bringing it here. The reason why I need the, say five or four or five days is because a contractor comes from out of state and so they need to have adequate truck space and if they all of a sudden get surprised with 15,000 pounds or something like that, they can run out of room and they're not gonna get a truck there from out of state you know, in the time they need it. So just give me a heads up. Uh, it doesn't have to be down to the nearest pound, just say three shuttles, roughly 3,500 pounds, something like that. That's all I need. Uh, we don't accept rinse aid. We don't accept empty containers, pesticides only. Lastly, we'll get into the B topic. Um, around 2006, there was a colony collapse disorder. They were noticing bees disappearing, and there's multifactorial reasons for this. However, if you ever watch the news, you'll only hear about pesticides and not any of the other factors. On the left-hand side, there's colonies in millions starting in 1945, roughly six million in 1945 or 46. And uh, the steep decline there was when the Varroa mite was uh, causing issues. And on around 2005 there, it's two and a half million colonies. So there's been a steady decline uh, continual after 1945. So some of the factors, pests, parasites, disease, um, genetic diversity and nutrition. And I've been told that uh, you know, they're bringing their bees from large distances, oftentimes, Texas, California. And apparently they feed them a, basically like a sugar water diet, and that's not enough to sustain the bees' health, which also makes them more susceptible to pests and parasites. And then uh, also pesticides do play a role, it's just not the only role. I'll skip over this one, it's not applicable there. Obviously, if they fly through, I have a question for you on those bee things. Sure. Uh, uh, are there, is there any bill in the bills in the hopper right now in regards to the better registration of the bee people? Um, not that I'm aware of. I think that they're starting to register them more than what they did in years past for the simple fact of uh, we've been saying, well, if we're expecting applicators to be checking uh, the map I'll have on here in a little bit, and uh, to find out where they're at. And if you're not taking the time to register your location, especially for aerial applicators that are going, what, 140 miles an hour or somewhere in there, uh, obviously you're not gonna be scanning uh, inside tree rows and stuff to see if there's some uh, beehives. So they don't have as much leeway to file a complaint if they don't register, I guess is the easiest way to put it. We came up with the North Dakota Pollinator Plan, and what that is is basically voluntary best management practices, not only for applicators, but for the beekeepers themselves and landowners. 
I only listed the applicator portion in here because that's what you guys are. If you want to go to our website, you can read it in its entirety. But some of the things we're asking applicators uh, to utilize IPM, the economic thresholds, product choice, tank partners, using registered pesticides according to the label, which that doesn't matter. You're supposed to do that regardless. Um, applying when bees are least active, early morning, late evening, temperatures less than 65. Be aware of obstacles then and temperature inversions as well. Uh, avoid drift to hives, flowering plants, and water. Identify and notify beekeepers. They change that to two miles. It says three on here, but it's within two miles of a site at least 48 hours prior to the application. And here's the apiary map. There's the direct link down at the bottom in yellow. You'll select apiary, select your county, select apiary again. They also have vineyards and organic up there. Then you click on the dot and you get the contact information to pop up. So if there is one in the area, you can contact them or see if they're willing to uh, move or cover their hives. Um, what some people have told us, if uh, they've called and the beekeeper may not want to move their hives, but they talk to the, or you say to the customer then is, sorry, can't spray, um, so-and-so's got bees there. Then that landowner oftentimes will got, get a hold of the beekeeper and say, you need to either move them, get them out, cover them. So if you run into some resistance, that's an option. Some of the label language regarding bees. This product is highly toxic to bees exposed to direct treatment or residues on blooming crops or weeds. Do not apply this product or allow it to drift to blooming crops if bees are visiting the treatment area. So when a label says do not, that's, it's, uh, you know, it's cut and dry. It's not advisory language. Um, this one here, it basically says the same uh, at the top there, and then it, get, it goes into more detail with saying, notifying beekeepers within one mile of treatment area at least 48 hours before will give them time to cover or move their hives. For crops in bloom, except soybean and corn, do not apply this product to target crops or weeds in bloom. So that pretty much shuts that down for those. But it says for soybean and corn, if the application cannot be avoided when target crop or weeds are in bloom, limiting the application time to when bees are least active, two hours of sunrise or sunset, will minimize the risk to bees. Again, of course, watch out for obstacles and everything else if you're, uh, you know, if it's not uh, very visible conditions. And then temperature inversions are oftentimes early morning and evening as well, so it's another thing to be aware of. Some of this label language is a direct result from a case that happened in Oregon. I think that was maybe two years ago. Um, 50,000 bumblebees were killed, and what happened was a Target store was getting complaints from their customers saying that aphids were making a mess on their cars. So they hired an ornamental and turf company to come in. They sprayed. Bees were also visiting the trees, and then the customers were complaining because bees were dead uh, in the parking lot. So. They couldn't win there, but uh, the company had to come in, cover the trees to prevent for more bees, uh, you know, from visiting. They suspended, I think, 18 or 20 some pesticides. Oregon did the Department of Ag there, and then EPA uh, worked fairly fast and changed label language. Some of the titles here says. Uh, Bee genocide took place during National Pollinator Week. Um, what else does it say? Over 300 wild honeybee colonies have been wiped out. Um, they held a funeral, I guess, for the bees afterwards. So, uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> these are some of the active ingredients and some of the names that uh, have changed. Oops. Well, somehow it's not showing up here, but um, there should be a slide that, for some reason, it deleted off or something, but it had a little B inside a, a diamond icon. There'll be specific B language if you see that on your labels. 
So it'll have a little honey bee and then it'll be a diamond around it. Um, and then it'll say basically you cannot spray that chemical if bees are foraging. So that's another cut and dry label statement. And then it'll say uh, you still can't, if the crops are, uh, crops are in bloom, you cannot spray unless one of the conditions is met. Basically, all the conditions are not applicable to you, uh, except if your state has a registered apiary program, which we do, and we list that map. That's what that's talking about. Um, and then this one here, which says, the application is made due to an imminent threat of significant crop loss and a documented determination consistent with an IPM plan or predetermined economic threshold is met. And then it says every effort should be made to notify the beekeepers at least 48 hours beforehand. If you use this option, if, if the label you're spraying has this, these statements on there and you decide to use this option, I would make sure you contact, say, an extension agent or somebody like that that documents that you've met the economic threshold or have, you know, somebody documented it anyways. Because if it gets drawn up into court and, you know, it's another coworker or a buddy of yours, it's obviously not going to look as good if you had, you know, a third party extension agent or some other government official. If you make applications to tribal land, they have jurisdiction. Their contacts on the right hand side, my contacts on the left. Any other questions? All right, yep, thank you. Thank you, Jeremiah. I also want to remind everybody that on the Aeronautics Commission website, you can find an aerial applicator uh, map, which shows the, the listings that the Department of Agriculture also has with sensitive areas, and also uh, it shows where all the MET towers are located uh, throughout the state so that we can stay safe. Our next speaker today is Trevor Woods. He's the airspace uh, manager for our unmanned aircraft systems test site in the eastern part of the state, so he's going to update us on UAS activity. All right, so yeah, Trevor Woods, the aerospace manager for the Northern Plains UAS test site. Um, last year I had quite a bit of information. This year I got it pretty short. I'm, I've only really got two slides after this and hoping you guys have some questions about it. Uh, you may have seen it in the news uh, during a press release. Uh, we received authorization from the FAA that covers two thirds of the state with a certificate of authorization or waiver to fly unmanned aircraft. Uh, as you can see there in the green, we had to split it up into two. This is called the Northern Valley COA, and the one off to the west there is the Bakken COA. Uh, it allows us to fly five different unmanned aircraft systems uh, within those areas under certain provisions. And uh, we are also going to be expanding here to the south to eventually cover the whole state. This was done uh, mainly just due to, uh, you know, time commitment with the FAA and for the test site. We have a lot of entities who want to come to the state of North Dakota and fly unmanned aircraft and do research and testing. And for us to go get an individual COA for each one of those customers at each individual location for each individual airframe ends up being a lot of man hours and a lot of time on the FAA and for the test site in North Dakota. So we're able to work with the FAA to get a large blanket approval like this. And we also have the ability to add on additional airframes as we keep moving forward with this. Uh, the common provisions that you'll see here, day VFR operations, we're not flying in IFR conditions, we're not flying uh, at nighttime at this time. We do have the ability to potentially expand it in the night, but we're not doing that right now. Uh, visual line of sight operations only, so any of the pilots of the unmanned aircraft, which by the way, they are all certified pilots, uh, will have to remain visual line of sight, which is typically about a mile, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, depending on the size of the airplane. There is a dedicated observer that is required to be 
They're in conjunction with the piloting command, and they're there to facilitate scene avoid or detect and avoid, or however the FAA wants to call it today. So there's a dedicated person there who's watching for traffic, and the onus is usually on the pilot to scene avoid. So if, if you're flying pretty low level, uh, chances are the crew of the unmanned aircraft are going to land that vehicle uh, as soon as practical, and a lot of times they'll just steer out of the way. You know, there's, it's just like flying any other airplane. We just stay away from each other. Uh, I put, in, uh, I, I put a note that a chase plane has a potential opportunity in the future. The FAA does ha allow the ability to use chase aircraft to follow the unmanned aircraft. It's not something we're going to be doing anytime near term, but it has that potential to be there. That's a separate authorization we have to go through with the FAA to get that, though. Uh, below 1,200 feet AGL class golf airspace only. So anywhere that uh, the class echo starts at 700, we're not allowed to fly. Uh, you might be asking yourself about airports, and yes, I mean, we do have the ability as certified pilots to fly in the vicinity of airports. We do not have the ability uh, at all the airports just to take off and land from the fields directly. To do that, we've been working with uh, uh, some of the airport folks and, and the airport managers to get agreements, and those will be done on a case-by-case -case basis. We are required to post a 48 to 72 hour advance NOTAM uh, to notify anybody of our operations. Uh, so you will see that on the NOTAM website. It's a requirement by us. The other thing about this is we don't just post a NOTAM. We have to, as part of agreement with the FAA as a test site, we also have to uh, notify all the controlling facilities about a week in advance that we're going to be flying. And when we actually get out there day of operations, whoever or wherever we're flying, the landowners, the air traffic controllers, the airports, if we're in the vicinity of somebody, we have to make notifications to them as well. So as many people as we can have them in the know, um, we, will, we will do that. And of course, the NOTAM's out there as well to let other pilots know where we'll be. Uh, and a lot of times, uh, our agreement with Minneapolis Center is even though a NOTAM's posted, you know that sometimes a NOTAM's posted, but it might not actually be in use. Uh, we're required to contact Minneapolis Center and let them know when we are actually flying and when we're done flying. So if you ever have a question and want to know, you know, give the uh, Area 4 frontline manager a call at Minneapolis Center and he can let you know uh, what he knows and, and we relay that information as, as quickly as we can. We are only allowed to fly one UAS in a defined operating area from a single control station by one PIC. So you might see this entire map as being authorized for us to fly. We are not allowed to light up that entire area under one NOTAM and say, hey, we're going to be flying anywhere, good luck. We have to define small little circles, one, two nautical mile, maybe three nautical mile radius, depending on what we need, and they're going to be set up in individual locations in those, those COAs as needed. Uh, they're not going to be posted indefinitely or anything like you'll see with the TFRs. We are only going to post them when we need them. Uh, no flying over people or buildings or land without permission. So we're not going to be flying over people's uh, farmsteads or houses or crowds of people. Uh, typically, this is going to be in non-urban areas, uh, usually in somebody's field. All operations that are conducted under the test site, uh, they receive authorization from an independent safety review board. So even though we have this COA, it doesn't let anybody just come to a test site and go fly. We have to go through a very rigorous process that's defined um, and, and agreed upon with the FAA and they have to have all the information on the airplane, we have to vet the airworthiness on the airplane, uh, and it has to go through an independent safety review board. We also have a UAS Research and Compliance Committee. They address a lot of the ethical concerns with unmanned aircraft. So you might hear the common one being privacy. Are these things spying on me? Are they taking pictures? That's what that committee is, that's what that committee is for. They're made up of uh, a cross-section of the community up in Grand Forks, and they're looking at potentially expanding that further out. Uh, Non-pilots, non-aviation folks who can express their concerns and they can talk about it. And the main discussion is always about the data management. What are we doing with the pictures? What are we doing with the video? When we go fly, we have a certain need for those pictures and video, and it's typically related to the research of the mission. For example, last summer we were flying for NDSU Ag Extension Services. So we were taking pictures of fields. The UAS Research and Compliance Committee said, if you inadvertently take a picture of you know, public roads that people are driving on, uh, somebody's house, you know, that's fine, but that data must be deleted once it's reviewed, and it cannot be retained. And us as the test site, we cannot retain that data. That's given to NDSU, and it is their data. We can't distribute, we can't do anything with that unless further agreements are set in place. So we're not out there spying on people. Uh, 
Additionally, we are reviewed by a flight readiness review board for day of operation. So we are set to go fly, for example, tomorrow. We are starting the day before through the day of and going through one additional review process to make sure everything's been set up, has the NOTAM filed, are all the latest uh, documents with the pilot on that airplane, to include airworthiness, to include all the maintenance logs, all the records. Uh, do you have your pilot certificate? Do you have your medical? Do you have your logbook? All those questions are asked and it is very in-depth before they're allowed to go fly. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's really nothing unmanned about it. There's a lot of people and a lot of reviewing that's going into this because we don't have the benefit of the established uh, manned, traditional manned operations that we do for unmanned. That's really all I've got. I just wanted to show you the provisions, talk about it. Yes, Jay. So in a nutshell, basically what you're doing with the COA, just to explain in the simplest terms, is you just file an IFR flight time on ABC as you, you're out there and when you're back on the ground, they don't have it. Yeah. In a nutshell, it's, yeah. it's, it's air traffic based. That's all the COA is. They just want to know who's out there and why. Mm -hmm. So they're talking to them, and uh, that way they can alert the public to what's out there. So. That's exactly right. And, and we, we don't file, but it is essentially like that. You know, yeah. we are. Nutshell, that's what yeah. Exactly. We're calling Minneapolis and we're saying what we're flying, where we're flying, what we plan on doing, how long we're going to be up there, and we are required to give them a call when we're done. And not just Minneapolis, but if we're within any of the uh, uh, approach departure corridors, so Grand Forks, Fargo, Bismarck, or Minot, we are also talking with those uh, approach departure controllers as well. Uh, we actually have a letter of agreement right now with uh, Grand Forks Air Force Base when we're working with them. We have additional provisions and contact, contact uh, provisions that we have to do. We're currently in progress establishing an LOA with Minot, and they're actually out of Ellsworth Air Force Base, those controllers are, and so that should be coming near term. So we're talking to everybody, Jay is absolutely right, this is an air traffic thing. Yeah. What size of the UASs are you flying? Uh, anything from maybe three feet by three feet quadcopters that are not flying more than a couple hundred feet up. Uh, the largest one we currently have approved under these COAs is a in situ scan eagle, and it's about ten and a half feet wingtip and about four and a half feet nose to tail. Uh, that one definitely has the ability to fly to a couple thousand feet. We're not flying that high because we're only allowed to go up to 1,200 AGL. Um, near term, we do anticipate seeing other airframes approximately that sa same size or might maybe slightly larger, but not much, uh, potentially being added onto this COA as well. And uh, a lot of those airframes, as they, as they increase in capability and size, they have additional requirements that, that are required to be on that airframe. For example, the larger ones, uh, I know the ASIs are typically going to want to see nav lights on those planes, or strobes or beacons or something that help facilitate with scene avoid. Uh, the Scan Eagle, for example, we actually have it painted with orange on the wings and on the fuselage so that it makes it easier to see. Because a lot of these systems are built for the Department of Defense. They're not intended to be seen. They're gray so that they can blend in with the sky. We're doing the opposite. We're trying to make them visible. So a lot of times the ASIs uh, that review this stuff are going to ask us those kind of questions. The larger ones, for example, like the Scan Eagle, also have a transponder. And even though we might be at low altitude, we're still required to squawk. It's, it's got to be on. If it's not, it, we're not flying. It's got to be working. So as the sponsor of the COA, are you requiring some of the colorations of those birds? We don't have anything defined. Uh, it, it's kind of, once again, on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, you know, the Scan Eagle, because of its size, and we saw that it was gray and very much a Department of Defense-based airplane, you know, it, it, it's just one of those things, before we even went to the FAA, we're just trying to think about, you know, what is it that the FAA is going to ask us questions on. One of the things we have as part of the test site is a safety management system. It's piggybacked on with the University of North Dakota. Uh, in case you don't know, the test site administratively lives at UND, so like myself, I'm actually an employee I'm a UND employee, but I work for the test site as well. Uh, part of that safety management system is when these customers come on and they bring in these airframes, uh, you know, we're standing back and we're doing a full risk assessment on this airplane. Anything we can think about with this airplane that could potentially be questioned by the ASIs, by the air traffic, by pilots, by anybody, we're, we're trying to address that and have an answer for it. We have a, a dedicated director of safety who, that's his primary job is to figure that stuff out. And before we even go to the FAA, we have a list of risk assessment that we uh, uh, will provide to the FAA to say, hey, look, here's why we think we can go fly in this and we can go do that. You know, for example, these provisions, a lot of these things, 
we, we basically stated in a document to the FAA, hey, we anticipate that this is what you're going to ask us to do. We just want you to know ahead of time that we're acknowledging that those are our provisions. We even have some self-imposed provisions that, uh, that we're required to do. One of those big ones was that we were, uh, we were preventing ourselves from flying at Minot in, in Minot approach departure control airspace until we had an LOA. FAA never actually told us that. We told them that up front that that's something we're going to do. And they said, you know what, that's a great idea. We're going to do that as well. Yeah. Uh, back to the strobing of these and stuff like that. Some of that discussion just came up in the applicators meeting, and, and mostly it had to do with the little quadcopters that are smaller and, and stuff like that. And I, I understand you're, you said you're trying to make yourself more visible rather than hide yourself. Uh, are you are you just doing some of that stuff for your for your own units, or are you required by by the uh, Basically, the COA says that if you have lights, they must be on. So it's not saying that you have to have them, but if you do have them, they got to be on. Um, the thing is, is we have, there's so many different unmanned aircraft out there that when they come to us, and, and we're still in our infancy, so we, we honestly haven't had an influx of airplanes come into us yet and say, hey, you know, and, and some of these things are so small that we might have difficulty mandating putting LEDs or, or, or other things on that airplane, or maybe they don't have the battery power to do so. Those are questions I don't have answers to yet. That's part of the director of safety's job is to figure that stuff out. Um, so there is no mandate that we have to have lights on them, uh, but it's just one of those things that's it's good practice to do. We, we are attempting to do it. If at all possible to have these things as visible as possible, we're going to try to do that. Yeah? Is, is there going to be a separate uh, NOTAM category for this where I can just go on four flight and go UAS NOTAMs? Because otherwise I'm going to have to sort through every NOTAM in the state to yeah. find these things. And so these get filed under ZMP's airspace um, as airspace NOTAMs, and they'll say unmanned aircraft activity. Uh, Lockheed Martin, as you know, who owns the uh, flight service contract, they are working on improving their online system that will be able to show you a map of all the NOTAMs that are filed of unmanned aircraft activity. So that's something they're working on in progress. They've been vocal about doing that. Um, they're looking at integrating other features for people who file flight plans. I don't know the details of that. I'm not sure what the status is. Uh, but it is something they're working on right now. You know, I, I think right now you can go online and see where all these NOTAMs are filed, but I'm, I'm not 100% on that, so I don't want to tell you that that's for sure. I don't know if you have any. I thought they had something already. Did they? Yeah. yeah. And on that 1-800 uh, uh, brief site? Yeah, um, because the FAA's had such a deal for 15, 20 years, as long as I've been on the, the web with the FAA, at least 15 years anyway. Uh, that place where you could go and you could actually click on it and see the TFR. Okay. Uh, as such, you know, what are they categorizing on the answer or what have you? So the plus side is, is that anything in 30 days, which these will never be, uh, it's published. And so you're going to see stuff falling off that depiction. The, uh, the trick is you got to ask. You know, you, you won't have to ask for them then, though, I guess is what I'm saying. They're going to look at your own flight and it's just going to give them to you. I'm just thinking for our industry, you know, if we're going out in the morning, we need to click on one or two things with our, you know, our phones yeah. and look to see where you guys are running, see if there's going to be any conflicts or whatever. That, I mean, that's the safest and easiest thing for us to have to sort through every unlit tower and, you know, obstacle. And I mean, it just, you, I mean, you get notams for a route right now in four flight and you got a page and a half sometimes. Right. I mean, it's, it's tough to get through all those. I can see the same thing, you know, and I don't, I don't know if we could do it regionally. You know, if I work out of West Fargo, if I, you know, type in NOTAMs for, you know, Delta 54, what comes up? Do these things come up in it, or, or you know, where do we find these things at a, 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 in a in a quick time frame? Yeah. Um, of course, you have right now about how often you fly. Uh, last summer we flew, I want to say, 14 or maybe 15 times. Uh, over a three-month period down at Carrington uh, for Carrington Research Extension Center. And we also had a flight up at uh, Sully's Hill near Devil's Lake. This year, we're potentially anticipating more operations, but it's, it's like a lot of these times. You know, what happens, we have customers that come to us, and they have a mission, and they have uh, research that they're trying to do to develop their unmanned aircraft. They have an idea. It doesn't always mean it's going to be executed. So right now, I can anticipate to say we'll have more than that, but I, I don't know an exact number of what that would be um, other than day VFR operations, which are our current limitations. Uh, there will be 
maybe a push to try to go some higher altitudes, but when we do that, it, it's going to be very selective. It's not going to be broad COAs like this. The FAA is never going to approve us for that because we're still relatively new. We're still in our infancy according to them. We're not mature enough to allow those kind of operations. So um, where I'm getting at is, let's say we do fly to 3,000 feet or 5,000 feet or 7,000 feet. Um, those are going to be very, very limited on a case-by-case -case basis, and there's going to be a, a lot more uh, notifications and a higher standard that we're going to be held to by the FAA uh, before we're allowed to do something like that. But but on your NOTAMs, I mean, absolutely understand. I'm with you there. I, I hate going through pages of NOTAMs as well. As I understand, Lockheed Martin is working to improve that system, but I just don't know where they're at with that right now. And that will actually transfer right over to full flight right. once they get it, so that's the good, good deal there. So. Anything else? I don't know what you guys have for a website or anything, but if you could pinpoint where some of these operations are, that would help us. We can just go to your website and say, here's where we're going to be operating in the next, you know, seven days or whatever. Just give us an idea so that, that we know what's That's a, It's a good suggestion. I'll pass that along. I know we have a, uh, a software management system that we purchased that will have, at least in the field, we have the ability to, to bring in all different kinds of data to include GIS, NOTAMs, everything, and display it on a, on a centralized location. I think it's web-based, so I'll talk to the uh, uh, people who manage that and, and see if that's something we can do, is if we can display a, you know, a screen real-time. Um, and the other advantage I know is UNDs have requested something similar because they want to know to integrate it with their traffic and, and all of their folks flying to know where all the unmanned aircraft are going to be flying. Um, so I'll make sure to pass that along. It's a good suggestion. Anything else? Perfect. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. A lot of great cons uh, conversation on UAS activity. Uh, next, I'm going to invite David Gust forward from the North Dakota Agricultural Aviation Association to give us an update on uh, their association and their UAS initiative. This thing, right? Yeah, we just uh, got done with the uh, Tri-State uh, Agricultural Aviation Association's uh, uh, convention last week, and there's a lot of talk on UASs. Um, Andy did bring up something interesting about the past program, is that they went over some real basic maintenance things there, like your suck bag. You know, that's something you should learn before you get into an airplane, but then they're talking about these electric brakes that are coming out there on all these airplanes, the fan brakes. And they said, how many guys are using your fan brake to turn your, your spray on and off? And a bunch of people raise their hands out there. Well, if you're doing that, your suck back is useless. So that's why they have to keep revisiting those things, because we keep doing dumb stuff. And, we're, and you know, as long as we're drifting and dragging stuff into the next field, we're going to keep hearing about that stuff until we quit doing it. So, uh, uh, you know, it was basic stuff, but it, it, we keep doing those same things. Um, there was a lot of talk on bees again. Um, you know, um, we're getting the blame for a lot of what's happening. Uh, it's unfair, yeah, but, you know, it's, what, it's, what's, it's the perception out there. Um, every, every insecticide label says do not spray when pollinators are out in the field. So if we kill any bees, we're off label. So. Try to, try to work out a real good relationship with your beekeepers in your area. Um, that's, the most, that's the most important thing is to communicate. Those guys will take some kills if you talk to them all the time. Everyone I've ever worked, worked with has never been a problem. Um, uh, legislatively, there were some bee bills uh, that got killed in committee. Uh, so nothing's really coming out of there. Nothing's coming out of there for financial responsibility this year either. Um, so we really don't have anything to worry about in this legislature. Um, uh, then the UAS safety. I'm not worried about these guys so much as I'm worried about everybody who's buying these little $800 units from wherever and out there buzzing around with them. And I'll give you a scenario. I worked for a guy in the wintertime. He told me about his brother who bought one, brought it out to his place. They shot it up in the air, ran it a half mile away to take pictures of their neighbor's place and brought it back. Then they reset the, the uh, ceiling on the thing and shot it up to 1,200 feet just to see it could do that. Couldn't see it at all, but they were up messing around at 1,200 feet with this thing when they're buying over the counter. 
And these are going to be all over the place out there. I work in this area, so I'm real close to a, a populated area. So I can see guys out in their backyard on the fringes of town having a couple of beers and a barbecue and launching one of these things and you know, taking them two, three miles out of town and messing with them. And that's the kind of stuff I think we're going to be seeing this year. And those are the kind of things that worry me. Uh, it's important, you know, use the FAA. When that, if you see that kind of stuff happening, report it. They need to hear about it so that Washington understands that they're going to be a problem. If, if, nobody, if they don't hear anything about it, they're not going to do anything about it. And so keep Jay busy. That way he won't be able to come and investigate any of the complaints about us. <laughs> see? So, um, um, and the other thing is to ferry at 500 feet. Those things are supposed to be below 400 feet. If you're at 500 feet and, you know, you, you hit one or something, you know, you're going to be in the, in the right every time. So, you know, get up there when we ferry and, uh, you know, it'll keep us out of some danger. We should be up there anyway. So, yeah, turbines turn up above that. So, <laughs> my, my airplane is a ceiling of 300 feet when it's loaded. So, um, yeah, that was, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Uh, Glenn, I mean, you anything else to add to it? I, no, I think you've covered everything. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Those are proposed rules, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yep. But for the hobbyist, the guy who's buying these little things, their ceiling is 400 feet. They're not supposed to be up above that. I don't, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But anybody who's buying these things over the counter, they're hobbyists, period. If you've got a, if you've got a farmer who's out there taking pictures of his field and, and uh, using it to you know, do inputs, that's commercial use. You know, it's tough to turn in one of your customers. I mean, I, but you know, you, you got to ha talk to the FAA, and they'll just talk to them. They're not going to. They're not going to write them up. But I had one of my very good customers commercially operating these things last year. This time last year, they were advertising uh, seven bucks an acre. You could have one of these things fly over your field five or six times during the year. Fortunately, the first one they went out with. Uh, I watched them do it a couple times, but when they went out to start doing it, it shot straight up in the air, came right back down, and put a $25,000 hole in the ground. So they were done for the year, and I don't think they're back in it. But I had, I had five different operations within 40 miles of my home base that were, that were commercially operating these things last year. I think Jay had a conversation with a couple of them. So, so yeah, maybe. That's because what the, it's what the well, label says. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's slowed way down. Well, I, I, think, I think the commercial operations have come to a screeching halt. I mean, I, everybody who was going to be in business around me last year is out of it. But it's, just, it's, it's the same thing. It's like the farm is so low, I won't go higher than 500 
Right. <laughs> right. I, I understand that. But that's, that's the facts of life. Yep. Oh, yep. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Well, and again, that's we have to do what we can do. We got to keep our eyes open and look look for look for pickups parked on corners of fields or that's the kind of stuff we got to look out for. And you know, we're saving our own bacon here. You know. I just think it's ironic as hell because well, they're going right by us. Yeah. yeah, and actually what I suggested we talked about this last week was is that, and I'm going to do a little bit of this this week, talk to everybody that I can get a hold of here at the convention. Um, I'm going to be putting together a letter to Washington explaining what we talked about and the concerns we've got. They've heard them, but I want to put it in a little bit different light, and that is, is that what I'm seeing is, is you guys understand. It's not the aviation community that doesn't understand. It's the, the agricultural committee uh, folks that don't understand what they can do and what they can't do. I'm going to suggest uh, that they get some kind of a formal team together that works with, like we're talking about Ag Week, things like that. If they won't do it, I'll write an article and I'll put it in the local Ag Week magazine and what have it, if they'll publish it. Um, because I think we were talking to a lot of these folks, they talk like, you know, it's basically smack the FAA, we're going to do this. And uh, so, you know, if we can get an article or two in some of these magazines, um, something like that, but I want it to come from Washington and we can do it. Um, and again, I, I fractured the law here and there too, and I have to do so. Well, uh, to get into a magazine where they didn't approve it, I'm not worried about that too much. <laughs> well, they'll, they'll publish it. Right? Getting the word out there. I, and they'll publish you know? it. I don't think you have yeah. any problem with that. I well, and I look at it as a safety issue for the state because Absolutely. I'm, I'm filed just like you guys are. So I don't want these things affecting what you guys do either. And you know, it's like we're talking about you know anything you see reported. I don't care what it is. I don't care if you know uh, if who the uh, where where it was at, or if you know the pilot was flying it, or if you can't fully explain the craft. What I'd like you to do is give me a location, a date, and a time that you saw this object. Uh, try to explain it as fully as you can, and report it to me. Call our office. And uh, we'll make sure that it gets filed as a complaint. Very simply, all it does is nothing else. It starts to get the numbers rolling so that when they say, well, we really don't have an issue in North Dakota. Oh, really? So those 475 complaints mean nothing. Oh, didn't know they were even there. So we, we've got to get the preponderance of evidence out to them so that Washington actually raises an eyebrow and does something. So we'll do everything we can locally, but we need you guys to help to do it. You know, we need the public's help, and uh, uh, the, the general public has done a lot to injure themselves over this. Uh, there's been people injured. I said I go back to the guy in the uh, TGI Fridays that decided to fly one inside the restaurant at Christmas, and he hung mistletoe on it, and he had two of them. He'd fly around the restaurant, and the couples would come in, he'd hover over and let them kiss under the mistletoe. And the local newspaper thought it was so cool and what happened was is the uh, reporter came in, she took some pictures, thought it was so neat. And the next photograph you see in the line of photographs is her nose split right down the middle because it went to land on her hand and she flicked her wrist or something, this thing went out of balance and bing, right through her nose. You know, so now all of a sudden the reporter has blood on her face from an unmanned aircraft. So, you know, it's kind of like the, the idiots that break themselves up on wheels and the you know, all the awards for people that do stupid things, they're going to publish it on Facebook and they're just hurting themselves by giving this stuff credibility. So I see the, in working with Trevor and the crews and uh, just the industry as a whole, I see a lot of benefit to come out of unmanned aircraft and what they can do commercially. Um, I've seen what it can do as far as a field where you can go and survey a field. Um, there's, in Japan, they're using a, a aircraft with I said, if you've ever gone to some of these different fountain places where you push a button and you get a bag of coke, you push a button, you get an orange crust, you put, you know, it's all in the same machine. But what they're doing is they're doing the same thing over in China. They've got an aircraft that's got different one gallon jugs of chemical in it, and they got a 300 gallon hopper on this thing. And when they're done with the unmanned aircraft surveying the field, it's already got mapped out exactly what thistle's here and what bug is there. And as this thing's flying along, you see the colors changing in the boom because it's catching in that area. I mean, they're that sophisticated. So now we're down to using less chemical. 
the right temple, the right area, things like that. So there's there's too much benefit. Well, we'll see. I mean, we've, we've had the ability to fly over these fields for how long, and uh, yeah. it, aerial mapping has never really taken off. You know, if they think they can do it, that's fine. But until then, you know, we got to watch out for them. So. Okay. Um, what I've got, I've got a couple of them here, and I'll, we'll be handing them out the next couple of days. You'll see a piece of paper like this, and basically uh, the AGL-220 branch is our next-gen branch. And we all have heard about next-gen with the FAA's game plan and ADSB in and out, things like that. Well, the UAS division of 220 um, sends our office and our points of contact information on unmanned aircraft all the time. We get uh, a monthly, here we are, this is what we're doing, that type of thing. When the NPRM came out for the second time, um, I believe when you look at it, I, I couldn't print it out because it's got to be 500 and some pages. I mean, it's huge. Um, but when you look through it, you see why uh, for basically uh, Part 107, which is the new regulations regarding unmanned aircraft. Um, what this is going to have in it is basically a basic outline of Part 107. And that outline is going to have in there that talks about that it's aircraft that are under 55 pounds, uh, visual line of sight only. And that means no goggles, no iPads, no cell phones. <laughs> they got to see it. Um, Talks about daylight operations only, uh, must yield the right of way to aircraft, manned or unned. So they've got, a, you know, they've got the same responsibility that we do. Uh, may use a visual observer. They're still restricted to visibility limits. Uh, like, uh, uh, well, let's see here, we've got first person view camera cannot satisfy see and avoid. So in other words, they've got to see it. Uh, max speed is 100 miles an hour, max altitude is 500, and that still blows me away why they'd even change from 400, it's already there, but uh, minimum weather visibility is three miles. Uh, no operations are allowed in class A, so above 18,000 feet. Um, you know, and it's funny because I've looked at these online and if you take an unmanned quadcopter that they're selling for eight, 900 bucks, and you take the battery that they've got in that unit and they, and they have you fly it, and Trevor can maybe back me up a little bit on this, but what I've read is, when they sell this thing, typically the batteries on these things, it's, it's based on battery power. So the more power, it's like more torque. We're going to put a 5,000 horsepower engine in this thing instead of 100, you know. Um, and they'll have like a plus 3 or a plus 4 battery in it, and they'll go very easily to 4,500 feet or so. Um, and for how long? 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever the game plan is for that much power. But if you start buying these bigger batteries, the plus 9s and so forth, they're taking them to 14 to 16,000 feet. And so it's truly battery power. So the same unit is only limited by the battery that the owner purchases for the thing. My concern for you guys, as turbine guys, is okay, you got a unit that's made of plastic and foam. Got a few electronic gizmos on it, not much that can really hurt you. But the thing that will stop your Garrett engine or cause your Pratt & Whitney to go down is that battery. You think how dense that battery pack is. That's the part that worries me. I mean, basically, it'll shatter in a million pieces when it hits you, but if that battery makes it way to the engine, that's the part that worries me. So, um, you know, really, these are a threat to us flying just the same as if you hit a bird. Um, and I won't go through the rest of all these rules. You guys can grab them and look through them, but like I said, I've got to print some more of these up. I've got some here if you'd like them today. And uh, if you got any questions, we'll try to answer them. Because right now we're about as knowledgeable as what you're seeing here, so they're learning. Yeah. You know, that's the thing that really kind of agitated me up until about, uh, it was about three months ago. All I ever heard was, if everybody's got to have ADSB out by 2 2020. And then I started looking at the real next-gen program, and that's not even close to true. A lot of what happened was is that the, real, the, the retailers got a hold of it that are selling you the equipment, and they kind of skipped through the part that if you're the only people that really must have is if you have to have mode C on your aircraft for that airspace. So essentially, you know, if you're in, in, in class Charlie, uh, you know, if you're class, some class Delta, uh, Bravo and Alpha airspace, you got to have ADSB out. Everything else, which was at one time most of North Dakota, 
you really didn't have to have it. Yeah, and you still don't. The nice thing that I'm seeing is, is Garmin's one of them, and we've been holding a lot of these uh, information packages up at uh, Fargo Jet Center. We do that once a month, the end of the month. Um, is that uh, Garmin came out with a unit for 3,600 bucks, give or take, um, and I'm sure plus an installation. But it's ADSB in, ADSB out. It's your WAS. It's GPS. You know, basically it's everything in a magical box about the size of that computer, maybe about half. And you, all you do is Bluetooth it to your ForeFlight or to your iPad. And so if you don't want to buy ADSB in and get all the weather and all that, it's all part of the box. So now all of a sudden you've got it for this, this incredibly low price, which I say that because when people are saying, oh yeah, ADSB, you can have it for like 1500 bucks, and you're going, I don't think so. <laughs> you knew that wasn't going to happen because even Garmin is telling you that a full ADSB system for an aircraft is going to be probably 20 grand if you're not set up. So that's, you know, so the, the ADSB out portion, yes, if you're using that airspace. But for you guys. I don't want to yeah. completely disagree with you, but have you seen what some of these apps are doing with your, with your iPad and an airplane? No, I haven't. Kind of blow you away. Oh, you mean the information they're giving you and whatnot? Oh, at least. Yeah. Everything for a standard VFR flight. You know, and that's the trick, and I love it, because it's VFR only. It's Yeah, it's VFR only. But information. We're always looking, you know, how cheap can I get it? Yeah, yeah. And I'm the same way you are. Um, I mean, when I flew all those years at Executive, we didn't have GPSs. We had the old steam gauges and VOR is all we used. So three quarters of us went down and bought GPS like Garmin 195s, handhelds, or, you know, of course, by then PD, PDAs hadn't come out yet. So we're buying these little clip mount units, and that's what we're using, and, you know, as backup units on a lot of our navigation stuff. And uh, I tell you what, that's the first thing I'd do if I really got back into fly is go pick me up an iPad, a flight, and all that stuff on it. You know, the only thing that comes a problem, and, and we've had this, this issue, very common, is because we're getting so much technology in the cockpit now, we're getting distracted. We're losing sight of what's outside. And so that itself is causing a big issue. Um, just <laughs> look at two Northwest captains that overflew Minneapolis. I always talk about that one. Gee, they were only looking at schedules, only. Um, but uh, it doesn't take much, you know, to sit there and waste. I mean, when's the last time you sat down at a computer just to check an email and 25 minutes went by? You know, so we really got to be careful with that technology when we use it. The other side of it, too, is if you're going to use it as your primary source of, of uh, let's say, navigation, like you can use approach plates, things like that. It's funny because I always tell guys, I say, okay, so what are you going to use a backup if that quits? And they say, well, i got a backup battery. Well, that's fine. What if the unit quits? <laughs> you know, because they are electronic, they're made by man, good power spike coming out of the cigarette lighter or something, and it's done. What do you do? And so that's the other, you know, topic. Yeah, exactly. And that's what guys do. Yeah, and the thing is, as long as you're thinking that line, you know, um, you got to back up with a backup. And even then, if you're on the backup, you should be looking for VFR and getting it on the ground somewhere, you know. So, but um, any questions for me while I'm up here for you guys? I mean, you're pretty good about calling me or talking to me whenever you have something. So, nothing? Okay, that's all I got then. Thank you. Perfect. Go. Thanks, Jay. You bet. Thanks. All right. Well, that concludes our session today. On behalf of the Aeronautics Commission and the State of North Dakota, I just thank all of you for, for coming and all of you for tuning in on the video today. And we hope that you have a successful uh, and safe spring season here in 2015. So thank you so much.